Good evening, everyone. My name is Darby Dickerson, and I'm honored to be the 12th president and dean of Southwestern Law School. I joined the school on July 1st, so if I've not gotten to meet you yet, I hope to do so in the coming months. We are recording this program, and we hope to share it with you later on YouTube. Because this is a webinar, the audience will not be shown on the recording. If you're here tonight, you know that we'll be celebrating Southwestern's 110th birthday on November 25th. And as you all know, Southwestern is a special place that has played an important role in legal education across the country and in California. For 110 years, we've admitted students with the ability to study and practice law, regardless of their gender, race, ethnicity, or other characteristics. In fact, our first graduate was a woman who became the first woman public defender in the nation. Our graduates also include the first black female judge in California, the first black female appellate justice in the nation, the first Chinese American federal district court judge in the continental United States, and the first Native American judge in California. Our alum, Tom Bradley, was LA's longest serving and only black mayor. And our list of trailblazers and firsts goes on and on. As part of the 110th birthday celebrations, we're excited that all former living deans of Southwestern will be were able to join us this evening. They're gonna be sharing highlights from their deanship and engage in a Q&A after that. If you have a question that you would like to pose, you can pose it in the Q&A box because the chat for this evening is turned off. The Q&A box is at the bottom of your Zoom screen right next to the chat icon. Before I briefly introduce each dean, I want to share that we've also launched 110 campaign to raise funds to support our students. The campaign will be going on for the full month of November. A little bit later, we'll post the link to our campaign in the chat box. Due the, to the generosity of some of our alums and friends, we have several challenge and match gifts that can be unlocked when we hit different milestones. Every donor and every dollar is important and some gifts can be unlocked based just on the number who participate and not the dollar amount they contribute. So I hope you'll take a few minutes and visit the site that we'll put in the box. So let me turn and briefly introduce the deans. We could go on and on about each one and I hope they'll incorporate some of their background in their discussions this evening. And I know they're gonna share highlights of their deanship so I'm not gonna go into those. First, we have Lee Taylor who is the ninth Dean of Southwestern Law School. And he served from 1978 until 2005, making him one of the longest serving deans in the country. A civil rights activist while attending college at the University of Tulsa, he served in the civil rights division of the US Department of Justice, where he served as lead counsel in one of the largest school DC aggregation cases filed by the department. Dean Taylor started his academic career at DePaul University College of Law, which is in Chicago, where he directed the law clinic, taught courses, and also served as associate dean. In 1977, he became the youngest law dean in the country when he was appointed dean at Ohio Northern University's Pettit College of Law. The next year, he became dean at Southwestern. Dean Taylor earned his JD from the University of Tulsa and his LLM from New York University School of Law. He was also a fellow in law and economics at the University of Chicago School of Law. Throughout his career, Dean Taylor served in important roles for major legal education organizations, including chair of the Law School Admission Council, LSAC, that most of you have heard about, and chair of the Board of Trustees of NALP's Foundation for Law Career Research and Education. And as most of you know, our law library is named in Dean Taylor's honor. He remains an emeritus professor at Southwestern. Next is Bryant Garth. Bryant served as our 10th Dean from 2005 to 2012 and currently serves as interim Dean and a distinguished professor of law emeritus at the University of California, Irvine School of Law, where he also serves as co-director for the Center for Empirical Research on the Legal Profession. Dean Garth is a scholar of the legal profession, dispute resolution, globalization, and the rule of law. He has written or co-authored more than 20 books and well over 100 law review articles. Before his deanship at Southwestern, he served as the director of the American Bar Foundation and dean of Indiana University's Maurer School of Law, where he served from 1986 to 1990. He also served on the executive coordinating committee for the After the JD project and chairs the advisory committee of the Law School Survey of Student Engagement. Dean Garth received his bachelor's degree from Yale 
his JD from Stanford, and his doctorate of law from European University Institute in Florence. Next is Austin Parrish. Dean Parrish served as interim dean at Southwestern from 2012 to 2013. He joined Southwestern in 2002 and served in a variety of roles, including director of Southwestern's Vancouver Summer Law Program, the Irwin Buckholder Professor of Law, and Vice Dean. After completing his year as interim dean, he was named dean at Indiana University Maurer School of Law. Yes, we have two Southwestern deans with Indiana connections, and Dean Parrish continues in the role of dean at Indiana. Before entering academia, he was an attorney with O'Melveny and Myers in Los Angeles, where he litigated in state and federal trial and appellate courts. He received his bachelor's from the University of Washington and his law degree from Columbia University School of Law. He currently serves on the executive committee of the Association of American Law Schools and on the board of the Access Lex Institute. And in 2019, he received Indiana University's Bicentennial Medal. My immediate predecessor is Susan Westerberg Praver, who served as the 11th Dean from 2012 through the end of June, 2021. She is our first woman Dean. She continues to serve with us as a professor of law. Dean Prager is a true child blazer who has many, who served in many prominent roles throughout her career. When she became Dean of UCLA Law, she was the first female law Dean in the University of California system and one of only two women law Deans in the entire country at that time. She served in that position from 1982 to 1998, which represents the longest tenure of any law dean in UCLA history. And she was the first UCLA graduate to serve in the post. While at UCLA, she also became the second woman ever elected as president of the Association of American Law Schools. She served on the governing boards of the Law School Admissions Council, there's LSAC again, and Council of the American Bar Association Section of Legal Education and Admissions to the Bar. In 1999, she temporarily left the Legal Academy and served as Provost of Dartmouth College and President of Occidental College in Los Angeles. But we got her back, and in 2008, she was named Executive Director and CEO of the Association of American Law Schools. Dean Prager was a trustee of Stanford University for 14 years and has also served on the board of Pacific Life, the Access Group, the American Council of Legal Education and other boards. And she has received many honors, including the Los Angeles Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Legal Services Award and the UCLA Law Alumni's first ever Lifetime Achievement Award. She received her bachelor's and master's degrees from Stanford and her JD from UCLA. We're now gonna hear from each Dean about highlights from their deanship. And then after Dean Prager speaks, so we'll start with Dean Taylor and go in chronological order. I'll speak just for a couple of minutes about a few of my overarching priorities, and then we'll move into questions and answers. So with that, Dean Taylor, thank you for being here we ask you to talk about your many years as Dean at Southwestern Law School. Uh, thank you, Darby. I'm delighted to be here and to share in this um, anniversary celebration of Southwestern's 110th year. Um, it's just wonderful to be on this panel with so many others and look back at briefly at our history. Um, Darby has asked each of us to talk about our accomplishments, challenges, and provide maybe a compelling story. I don't know how compelling I'll be, but I will certainly um, try to live up to that um, aspiration. Paul Wildman and Dean Boya have had a lasting impact on Southwestern. Paul was Dean when Southwestern was approved, when it was accredited really by the American Bar Association. And when, and when it first became a member of the Association of American Law Schools. Dean Boyack had significant responsibility for the creation of the SCALE program and securing a grant from the Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education, which at the time was the largest grant in its history. They also moved the school from Hill Street to the facility on Westmoreland and expanded its size. 
When I was appointed dean, it was extremely daunting to be selected to follow in their footsteps. I became dean, as Darby indicated, in 1978. We had 1,754 students at the time, and they were crammed into the Westmoreland building, which was even before the four-story addition was completed. We had parking for fewer than 100 students. The traffic police knew our class schedule well and would ticket student cars at the meters on Westmoreland. And occasionally I would wander out with lots of dimes and try to frustrate the traffic ticket um, giving. Our student faculty ratio at the time was about 60 to one, which was totally inadequate by any criteria. Adjuncts taught in a number of core courses and required courses were taught, taught in extremely large sections. <clears throat> Career and other student services were very limited. We had a small library in terms of collection, space, and services. And really faculty development was in its infancy. Bar results, which I think is a incredibly plaguing problem in our history, were unsatisfactory at the time. And fundraising was negligible. But it was not really all troublesome, as many of our students were extraordinarily active in Law Review, Moot Court, and the Student Bar Association, which was led by an incredibly outstanding president, Murphy Miller. Within a few years, we were able to manage the size of the student body to approximately 1,000. We reduced the size of first year sections. We developed a legal writing program staffed by full-time faculty, one of the first in the country to utilize full-time faculty, created the police program for people with childcare responsibilities, enhanced and expanded the curriculum to better prepare students for the bar and practice, launched a number of simulation courses, uh, such as trial advocacy and others like it. We established um, several years later, the Bitterman Entertainment and Media Law Institute. And during this period hired a number of exceptional faculty. And I really can only mention a few Catherine Carpenter, Chris Cameron, Anahe Garakarian, Karen Smith, and of course, Austin Parrish. We attracted an outstanding and dedicated staff, including Dory Heyer, Janice Manis, Linda Wisman, and Janice Yokoyama, who serve, and in some cases are still serving our students three decades later. Student services were improved, the library and its collection and services were expanded. And of course, that resulted in student satisfaction being dramatically improved. The Tom Bradley Scholarship Endowment was created with the first major fundraiser in the fall of 1978 through the tireless efforts of Erwin Buckholder, a graduate and a member of our board. Now, by the late 1980s, it was clear that the Westmoreland building was not adequate for all our needs. And we explored a number of options about expanding it or even the radical possibility of moving out of the city. Mayor Bradley counseled against it in part because the Wilshire Boulevard subway and the stop at Vermont were going to be built and completed. And he thought that would make a significant change to the school and in terms of its location. I guess, I don't want to say fortuitously, but after the 1992 riots, Bullock's Wilshire fell on tough times and Macy's, its owner, entered chapter 11 bankruptcy. Soon thereafter, they closed the store permanently and we began to explore acquiring it. The ownership of Bullock's Wilshire was very complex. Macy's had a lease with 30 plus years remaining and owned two lots on 7th Street. Caltech held the residual interest which had been bequeathed to them. Mayor Bradley led our negotiation efforts by calling the CEO of Macy's and the president of Caltech. Initially, a consultant we had, we had hired who analyzed the value of Macy's leasehold interest determined that the leasehold basis 
was zero and that we should make an offer of zero simply to take over the lease for Macy's. Understandably, Macy's was rejected and that's to put it mildly, they were offended um, and negotiations terminated. Uh, later that summer, I was attending an ABA meeting in New York City and thought I would just drop by the Macy's department store and see who I could talk to. I ended up meeting with the general counsel and we were able to reopen negotiations. After more negotiations with Macy's um, and with Caltech, we acquired both of their interests and were able to complete um, the fee simple in Southwestern's name. It's rare for any law student or law professor to ever put a fee simple back together again, but we did it. Um, as an afternote, the acquisition of Macy's interest was at an auction in the bankruptcy court um, for, uh, for approximately $4 million. For me, the immediate benefit was having sufficient parking for everyone at school. <clears throat> we began planning the renovation with the emphasis on the law library. And that was because we could free up space in the Westmoreland building for other functions once we had moved the law library into a more suitable place. Uh, shortly after we began planning, I got a phone call from a film production company. It wanted to lease the building for two months to do a film on location. The film was Dustin Checks In, starring Bay Dunaway and George Alexander and an orangutan, who I guess was Dustin Dunstan. Um, most of you probably have never seen the film or heard of it, but it did win several Razzies. Um, we, I initially rejected the idea that because I thought it would throw off our planning, which it ultimately did, but we received a lot of political pressure and professor, professor from um, others to engage in a lease with this film production company, which we did, but we had an extraordinarily significant holdover clause. <clears throat> Needless to say, um, the film production company could not keep the production within two months. Um, it set the res renovations back, but it paid us extremely well. This was followed by other film productions. Uh, for example, Taco Bell paid us a handsome price to shoot the exterior of the building for their famous ad, Drop the Chalupa, which I'm sure none of you have ever seen either. Um, not a very memorable ad. Planning um, for our renovations was extensive and we engaged a major architectural firm um, and made substantial progress. The library was completed in 1997 and the vacation of the street connecting the two buildings, eliminating Westmoreland in that section, and the development of the promenade was the result in large measure due to the efforts of uh, Los Angeles Councilman Nate Holden, <coughs> whose image you can see on the promenade at the fountain. <coughs> Renovation of other space, the second floor offices and historic rooms, the sixth floor Dean's office, and the tea room, faculty offices and classrooms on three and four, and, and finally the fitness facility followed rather quickly. The Congressman Julian Dixon courtroom was made possible in large part with federal funds, the result of our longstanding relationship with members of Congress, including Xavier Becerra, our Congressman at the time. Now the renovation of Bullock's Wiltshire would not have been possible without the extraordinary work of two people, Janice Manis and Linda Wissman. They really took charge of uh, most of the planning and most of the implementation of the construction. It also would not have been completed without the craftsmanship and dedication of our contractor, Joe Seward. Fundraising was also critically important. This was an expensive, expensive project and was successful successful because of the efforts of Deborah Leathers, um, Arlie Woods, our head chair, and other members of the board. As Darby mentioned, we celebrated the completion of the renovation with a gala in 2004. 
in which Justice Anthony Kennedy of the United States Supreme Court spoke, and where, to my surprise, the board named the law library in my honor. Darby has asked us to mention our post-deanship life. I live in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, um, and have continued to do ABA, AALS site visits, but not during the pandemic. I serve, continue to serve on the board of the National Association of Law Placement Foundation, as well as several nonprofits in the Vancouver area. And I've been an active as a past president of the Law School of Missions Council. With the border closed, I've not been able to travel, but do look forward to getting to school once things ease up and meeting again with faculty, alumni, and others who um, throughout my 27 years as dean, I enjoyed wonderful relationships with, which have continued and endured even electronically. I'm extremely proud of everything that has been accomplished after I left the deanship by Brian, Austin, and Susan during their terms as dean, and really look forward with great anticipation to all that will be accomplished by our Darby. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Taylor. And every day I walk in this building, I, I'm very grateful for all the work that you and others put into it because it is simply magnificent and a wonderful place to work and study. So thank you. We'll move next to Dean Garth. Thank you. I think my presentation will not be as, as good as a history of Southwestern because uh, I've actually been scrolling through the names of the people that are here. And that's what I've been doing the last couple of days is scrolling through the names of the people that I worked with at Southwestern. So in a way, I'm just gonna end up with uh, a, a few stories, uh, a few people I love to work with, and I could say so much more than I will. But I'll start with just the way I saw Southwestern when I arrived was you had this fabulous building. Thank you, Lee. You have this great location. You're in Los Angeles. You have a great alumni network. The ambitions for this school should be limitless. And I tried to live that ambition as Dean. Not hugely successful, but with some successes along the way. We started, I think the first two hires were great young faculty, Janine Kim, who just got a chair at Chapman and Gowri Ramachandran, who's still uh, connected to the law school. We set up a couple of clinics um, pretty close to the start. And I think part of the focus was on really building faith among the students, really getting to know the alumni, uh, really energizing the fundraising. And all of that was really fun with Dev Leathers. And that's one of my really fond memories is going everywhere we could find Southwestern alums. Also, we focused on the students and Again, Lee did the Lessee test before he left and I could do it every year and we had fun doing it. And this is typical of Southwestern. Robert Mena, who had just gotten his doctorate, invested fully in Lessee, became in fact, one of the leading national experts on how to use Lessee data. And we showed it to students, we showed it to faculty, we showed it to staff, and it actually really kind of helped boost, I think, a kind of our student facing experience. And I think it also um, was a way that we learned, you know, this is very simple, but no surprise, we learned that our students are among the, were among the leading commuters of all the students that took the lessee. And Deb and I were in New York, we took a visit to Brooklyn, we saw their housing and we thought this is something that we could really do to build community at Southwestern. Now, some ambitions were not realized, and but it's, it's a fun story and it was fun to live this story. Um, after almost a year, I called Pam Gann, who was the president of Claremont College and former Dean of Duke. And I said, this is kind of a wild thought, but would you at Claremont be interested perhaps in uh, you know, making Southwestern the Claremont Law School? And to my surprise, she invited me to come visit the next day. And we started talking and the Drucker program developed out of this and a lot of nice ties, a lot of nice meetings, and it never really came to fruition, but it came kind of close. And I think what killed it ultimately um, was the 
what I'll call the law school crisis, which is beyond the financial crisis, it was just the crisis of rhetoric about law school in a particular time and place. So one accomplishment that I'm very proud of um, shows only that I'm not super stupid because Leslie Steinberg and I think maybe Deb came and visited me one day or maybe two days and said, you know, we should have a director of diversity. And I said, oh, but we're so diverse already. And then they showed me who they thought should be the director of diversity. And it was Nerey Gray who came and transformed the law school. And one example right away when she started was she said, you know, you, there are many years when you are graduating no African-American males. They are flunking out because of attrition. And she said, you know what you do when you hire, when you bring them in? She says, you make offers to the super high credential group in the fall and the ones who were super excited about accepting Southwestern places get put on the waiting list and they lose more and more faith that they'll come to Southwestern until by the end, you're totally happy to have them. Why not make the offers at the outset? Then they're enthusiastic and then they're prepared. And Nerey really transformed the whole culture of academic support. And there were years when we, had, when we were graduating more African-Americans than any school in California. And that may still be the case. So I didn't completely mess it up, but I really got to see the, the huge benefits. Then the other thing that I think I, I did pretty well and I think Lee did pretty well too, is I recognized that there was a cohort of women at Southwestern that were just remarkably talented and committed to the school. And that's Dory Heyer, Deb Leathers, Janice Manis, Linda Wisman, and Leslie Steinberg, and all of them. They supported each other. They worked a thousand percent for the school. And I am proud that the board followed my advice to, I wanted to give them all honorary doctorates, but alas, during my tenure, I think only two of them did. I think it was Dory and Janice, but all of them deserve that. It, they, they made this school you know, really run effectively. Then there are two women in the Dean's office that I have to mention also. Uh, Janice Yokoyama was one incredibly talented, you know, really kept the, the ships moving or whatever the appropriate metaphor is. And the other is Karen Bello, who I see her name there. And there are many things I could say about Karen, just a remarkable woman. But the one that I like to remember is that I, I had a, you know, mainly symbolic, but an open door policy for students. They could come and see me. And if I was busy, which was usually the case, they would make an appointment and come. Karen would find out whatever their issue was. And before the student ever got to my office, she would have a suggested resolution that was exactly the right resolution for the particular problem. That's somebody who really has strong people skills and insight into the way the world should operate. Then I wanna mention one other brilliant thing that I think I did was I delayed my retirement until Austin would be appointed interim dean as a sure thing. I knew I was retiring, but I did not want a dean search to start until Austin had a year as a dean because everybody knew how gifted Austin was. And I just will tell one little story about Austin, which is one of the things I was very proud of is I. I'd met with uh, Joey Esposito and Bill Seiko, and I was convinced that trial advocacy was something we were really great at in Southwestern. And it seemed to all of us that what we should do is have options for students in the spring. One could be moot court, which was always the traditional activity for writing and advocacy. And the other would be the uh, trial advocacy. And then magically, it morphed into three things. The other one was a negotiation competition, which I think uh, Nerey had something to do with, but Austin just made it happen and just like that. So those are really all the things that I want to point out. I, it's an extraordinary community. We'll talk more about what makes it a special place, but it really is an extraordinary community. And almost 
it's almost painful to think what a wonderful place it was and what a wonderful time I spent there. So to finish the story, I went off to Irvine, convinced that I would be able to teach my courses, that my teaching would get worse and worse, that the student enrollments would get smaller and smaller, and then they would make me a generous buyout package and I would go retire. But it didn't happen. I, I kept getting involved. I chaired the Dean Search Committee and then I became kind of attached to the success of the Dean. So I became the Vice Dean. And uh, I had once when I was Dean at Indiana, I think I was the youngest Dean in the country. And then I was the oldest Vice Dean for sure in the country. So I decided to get back to really the life that I wanted of just writing and reading. I retired and then I flunked retirement. So I'm back as interim dean uh, here at UCI. Thanks. Thanks, Dean Garth. And our students and um, really the whole community also thank you for your idea of the residences and getting those up and built. They're such an important part of our community. So you're, you are much too modest about your accomplishments. Thank you. Next, we will move to Dean Parrish. Yeah, well, thanks, Dean Dickerson. And, uh, uh, you know, first, congratulations on the 110th anniversary to everybody. I like Brian, I'm looking at the names and it's so great to see so many friends and, and former students and, and board members and, and, and just great to be on this call. I feel a bit of a fraud, right? If, uh, if Lee gets 15 minutes, I, I should get almost 30 seconds for my time. Uh, and uh, I think what you just said was exactly right, Darby, that, uh, that Brian and Lee were much too modest. Uh, so I, I feel a great privilege to actually be with four uh, you know, leaders in legal education. Uh, Lee, I, I have a lot of gratitude too. He hired me. Uh, Brian uh, had the confidence to appoint me as his vice dean, which I'll ever be for grateful for. And I've always admired Susan and, and Darby, your uh, trailblazing uh, careers. And, and, uh, and so it's a, it's a great honor to be here. You know, I thought what I'd do is just talk a little bit about what was happening in 2012 and 2013, because as Brian said, it was a uh, it was things were changing in legal education and, and we had had so much success and we hadn't yet met Susan. So we didn't know what was uh, next in store for us. And so um, on the one hand, uh, it was a period of uncertainty. Uh, you'll remember in right after the great recession, we'd seen a big drop in, you know, hundreds of lawyers have been uh, laid off in, in 2011. There was hiring freezes in, in the state and, and local governments. Um, uh, we were starting to see the big drops in applications that affected nationwide. It wouldn't hit the, the low point until a couple more years, but it was clearly occurring at that point. And as Brian said, there was, um, well, there was a lot of cranks who, who had raised sort of important things about the value of legal education, um, but sort of lumped everybody outside of Harvard into one group, assuming that all schools were the same, not realizing that schools actually had very different missions and acted very differently. And they were super elitist and, and didn't really understand what was going on. And all that was coming at this at one time. On the other hand, it was a period I thought of amazing momentum. Um, you know, as you just said, the, the new residences were coming online. We just celebrated our 100th year anniversary. A, um, it was uh, uh, the entertainment program, the, the uh, Hollywood Reporter had just started ranking and we came in, I think, third that first year, fourth but the next year. Uh, we had just launched the first uh, entertainment LLM program uh, in the nation. Uh, we were just launching a new blog with Craig Matsuda, who was an LA Times reporter, really innovative. Uh, on the innovation side, the school, I think in 2011, 2012, had just been named a top 20 school for innovation. Uh, we were the only school that had two people named the top 25 most influential people in legal education, Brian Garth and, and Kathy Carpenter. Um, we, uh, you know, that, that was amazing. Our students were doing great things. Uh, Brian talked about the three track program where students could do negotiation and trial advocacy and and uh, in moot court. And, and that vision was paying off in 2012 when I came in. They were competitive on every single national competition. I, th I think Bill and Joey brought home four gold medals or four wins that year. Uh, Christina Knowlton and Ray brought back four wins for negotiation. The moot court honors program bought like half a dozen best briefs and semifinalists and quarterfinalists. And then diversity, which um, 
you know, it was just starting to have those conversations nationwide. We, we were at the forefront. Uh, we were the only school in 2012 in California and only two schools nationwide that had been named by, uh, the, had received the HEAT Award, the Higher Education Excellence and Diversity Award. Uh, we became the first school in 2012 in California to read this, receive the State Bar Organization uh, Diversity Award, which was extraordinary. They, we were ranked 15th in the nation for diversity and inclusion, um, which, was, which was right, probably under rank where we were. Um, because of Nerey's and other efforts, uh, uh, my year, we had more African-American students enrolled in law school than any other school in California. We, had, we were number two in the number of Latino students. We had the most MALDEF scholarships of any school at that time. Um, you know, these were these were remarkable achievements, and and you know other things. Uh, you know, the faculty, as as uh, Lee had said, there's great faculty, but we had fabulous people coming in in 2012. Nally Rodriguez had just started. John Heilman had just joined the school. I think Jay Gendron had started in 2011 or 12. There, uh, Jessica Birch and Bill Wood were just starting as visitors. Um, there was just a ton of excitement. I think as I was as leaving, Rachel Van Lanningham had joined, and so there was just a there was just a lot of excitement at the same time as we saw these things occurring on the national level. So I, I think my themes are very similar to what uh, Lee and Brian had, but I thought I'd touch on a couple of things that I was proud of during the year and a bit that I was Dean. And, and the first one uh, really had nothing to do with me, but it reemphasizes what, what, uh, what everybody else had said was um, just how hard everybody worked. You know, the, the tendency is when you get an acting dean is for everybody to go home. You know, <laughs> you've got a lame duck for a year and a bit. Why, why work? You know, I, there's nothing I can do as, a, as an acting dean. And if anything, uh, people put in an extra 110%. And so I remember the same things, you know, uh, uh, Deb Leathers got me on the street. We did 40 alumni receptions or more in that one year. Uh, you know, the conventional wisdom is you're not supposed to ask for funding as an acting dean. Uh, Deb told me to forget that. And we started putting up six, seven, and eight figure numbers. We, we didn't get them all in, but, but it was fun uh, and being able to tell the Southwestern story. Um, Anheet Garakanyan uh, stepped in as vice dean and, and uh, D Dory Heyer, and, and they worked around the clock, making sure that I didn't commit uh, dean malpractice during the, during the year I was there. Uh, I don't know how many crazy ideas I gave to Leslie Steinberg for different types of publicity, and she rolled with it. And, uh, and then uh, Nere Gray and, and Robert Mena, they had the idea, which, which was absolutely fabulous, that we needed to build the pipelines from the local schools. So almost once a week, we were at USC or UCLA or UC Santa Barbara or San Diego or any of the Cal States, uh, the Claremont Colleges, Occidental, you name it, uh, putting on programs. And it was sort of, uh, I was there just, just for the fun of it because they needed to have somebody with the name Dean uh, attend, uh, but they built those pipelines. And, uh, and so it was, uh, so one, I, one thing I was most proud of uh, was just how much everybody else stepped up to the plate in that, in that acting deanship to make me look good and, and keep things moving. And it was, uh, that was inspiring. And I think uh, goes to things that Brian and, and Lee were talking about, about the community. You know, the second thing that I, I, I was sort of proud of, and again, this wasn't me, it was, it was alumni, is, you know, I never came across a Southwestern grad who ever worried that they were going up against somebody from, let's say, Harvard. You know, just, you know, if you ask somebody, you know, were you worried that you were going against a Yale grad, they laughed, right? They're like, oh, we could run rings around those people. But then when it came down to the school itself, sometimes alums would sort of be more defensive. And uh, I remember an early lunch that I had with, with a grad and their husband, and their husband had gone somewhere else um, to law school. And the husband was going on about why his school was so much better. And uh, I didn't blame him. You know, he, he has a right to be proud of the place that he graduated from. But his wife should have just slapped him on the side of the head and told him that he was wrong, that Southwestern was a better school. And so we came up and Leslie and, 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 and Deb and a whole bunch of others uh, with this idea, you know, we needed a high, octane, a high octane pride initiative that we were LA's law school, that there was no school in the nation, that it had more of an impact on the city than Southwestern, one of the largest cities in the United States, one of the major legal uh, uh, markets in the world. And we had the data to prove it. So you, you know, uh, Darby, you mentioned it, right? The first African-American trial judge, the first Latino trial judge, the first Native American trial judge uh, in California, uh, right? The first African-American appellate justice, the first Iranian-American uh, judge in California, the, the first Chinese-American federal judge uh, in California. This is on the call, right? Like 
and th this was not like silver platter. You'd go to Yale and, you, you know, you have the world handed to it. These were people that were doing amazing things. And that, that sort of strength continued that day, that very year in 2012, Deborah Brazil was named by Los Angeles as the prosecutor of the year. She was also named by the California magazine as the criminal lawyer of the year. Phyllis Chang received the public lawyer of the year in 2012 by the State Bar of California. Uh, Robert Schwartz won, won the defense lawyer of the year by the Los Angeles County Bar Association. Um, they, we were just racking up. We had more, we had in 2012, we had more public defenders in the LA Public Defender's Office than any other school in the country. We had more prosecutors, I think 230 than any other law school in the country. We had 80 sitting judges in Southern California in 2012. None of the big firms, the 100 largest firms in the United States that had offices in LA, they wouldn't hire grads in the 70s, but we had number eight in the country for the number of partners in those schools or in those firms, uh, beating out higher than Columbia, higher than Stanford, higher than Chicago. Uh, and that said a lot, I think, about who we were, were and what we did. And so we, uh, you know, we went high octane with the idea that, you know what, we need to turn around a diploma. Brian had said this as well. If, if our 10,000 alums just stood up and said, you know what, we're going to hire and take care of our grads first, that there's no grad that is better than a Southwestern grad, and we're going to hire them first, and we're going to support them first, and we're going to put our money uh, in order to support them to make sure they have the same opportunities that we have. And so we went on a big campaign, and I, I thought that was a great thing. Hopefully, uh, like I think maybe that still is used a little bit. And then lastly, maybe quickly, the last thing I thought we started on, which was, again, things that Brian had started with the Claremont and, and with Rand, and was that I thought we needed to do more in partnerships. So we began negotiating agreement with Cal State Northridge, and I think that was signed soon after I, I, I stepped down. Uh, we started, uh, I was in negotiations. I don't think it ended up, but I was in negotiations with uh, Pitzer College. Uh, we started these pipeline programs with Cal State Dominguez Hills, Cal State Long Beach, a lot of the Cal State uh, schools. And a lot of what I kind of learned there from lots of people on how to build partnerships is things that I continued after I left Southwestern. And so I'll just end the last eight years I've been here at uh, Indiana University Bloomington and uh, taking a lot of the great things that I learned during my, uh, my time at Southwestern and applying it to another fabulous school. I think one of the things I've been very fortunate about is that IU has some of the same traits that make Southwestern truly remarkable which is the people. And uh, so I've been a fortunate dean and uh, fortunate to have such great mentors and leaders as, uh, as the other people on this call. So I'll leave it at that, Darby, but uh, thanks so much for including me tonight. Thank you, Dean Parrish. I think that, you know, you are a person that I work with on a regular basis through the AALS, and you have always been such an amazing cheerleader for the school. And it's wonderful and fun to see that that continues. Thank you for being with us tonight. Now we go to Susan Prager our 11th Dean. Susan, I need you to unmute. So one of my few regrets is that I got to work with Austin for only a nanosecond. And um, what you had to say tonight so beautifully, Brian, just uh, uh, Austin was um, so compelling and it made me focus on um, how much I missed you know, having you as a colleague, uh, but you were always there when I needed to talk to you by phone and um, you're still seen as very much a part of the place. So great, great to have you in this conversation tonight. My knowledge of Southwestern really goes back to Lee because Lee and Scott Bice at USC and I became really good friends as fellow deans in LA. And we were the ones um, with a lot of staying power, although the, the Dean of Pepperdine had that staying power as well on Phillips. And it was before US News. So the competitive pressures were just very different than they became. And so we were friends in fighting the California bar. Um, we, were, um, we were in touch with one another and we so generously included his fellow LA deans in the two celebrations of the Bullock's Wilshire acquisition, which will always be my most memorable times at Southwestern. You had Tony Kennedy, I believe, there for both of those events. You had Huel Hauser for at least one of them, Lee. Uh, and of course, Arlie was the board chair, I think, or, or the board chair at the time of the acquisition. 
um, if not the, the beautiful restoration that you did. They were out in the parking lot for the student and with beautiful tables and lighting. And then we got to come through and see what had been done to the building in those two different stages. Um, that was that was very, very special, Lee. But beyond that, you were a great colleague. You would always, um, always be good to talk to. And Lee tells me that he doesn't remember this, but I would never forget this. After the riots, um, we were talking on the phone a couple weeks later, and Lee told me that the day they were beginning, he sent the Southwestern guards over to Bullock's Wilshire to protect Bullock's Wilshire. It wasn't, wasn't Southwesterns, um, but Lee had this dream of acquiring Bullock's Wilshire. He cared about the building regardless of who was going to own it. And he sent the guards. And by the time they got there, he told me that people had broken glass at the street and were, um, and were looting, and, but they were trying to set fires inside the building. So that decision to send, and, and we know that many, many fires were set that night, um, but not, not at Bullock's Wilshire. Um, thanks to you, Lee. So I'll never forget that, that piece of your uh, Bullock's Wilshire history. Um, I, I became the executive director of the ALS, and I think I had just about completed four years in that role when I got a phone call from Catherine Carpenter. And she's, we had been in a number of meetings in common, but not meetings where we were talking to one another. I was on behalf of ALS sitting in on meetings of the ABA council, other meetings, Catherine was a member of the accreditation committee and there in that role. So we were getting to know one another better. We met long ago through Lee and she was the equivalent of what became vice dean with our changing titles over the years. So Catherine called and she said, I'm going to say something and I don't want you to say anything in response, nothing. You, those of you who know Catherine know that she can be very firm. And she was. And what she was calling to say is that she wanted me to think about the Southwestern Dealership. And I started to say something and she emphasized, no, 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 I don't want you to say anything now. I just want you to think about this. So I did. I had been um, turning away um, deanship inquiries because um, over a long period of time, I had felt that I had one law deanship in me, it was at UCLA, it was wonderful, the school where both my husband and I had gone to law school um, and, uh, and it was very rewarding. Um, but as I was beginning to look back on my career while at ALS, I thought about how the deanship was the most rewarding job. And the reason I felt that is that when you're a law dean, unlike other kinds of deans on campuses, you're also the department chair, essentially. You're very connected to the faculty, to the school, to the students, to what the place is supposed to be about. And as you move into a central administration, you get more attenuated from that. And you also find as a provost, for example, that other deans understandably don't particularly want you in their business. And so there, there is just less that's really um, deeply you know, rewarding and stimulating, I think, um, in that. And it wasn't that I was looking for a deanship. I had said no in another California context that I wouldn't think about it. But it was that it was Southwestern. And to me, Southwestern really epitomizes Los Angeles and is one of the institutions that helps make Los Angeles stronger and better. I didn't have the kind of content around that that I gained in these now um, eight years, uh, almost since I started. It is eight years, I guess, today. Um, so I, I feel that even more strongly. And of course, I didn't understand how special 
the faculty is in the sense of it, the faculty has never wavered in its devotion to students and, and students being at the center of what we're supposed to be doing at the center of what, what Southwestern is about. And there is a kind of selflessness to that that played out in very positive ways in the really um, scary times that characterized you know, the first long part of my time as Dean because I came in that climate that Austin was describing that was a product of the Great Recession. And the difference was that in prior recessions, people would think about going to school, but the combination of the uncertainties around the economy and the trashing of legal education that was going on, particularly in the New York Times and the Washington Post at the time, um, created a, a very different climate. Um, so I arrived at Southwestern officially. My first day was um, November 1st, 2013, although I'd done an event the week before and was around uh, that last week in October. Um, and what, what I realized was that the recessionary worries had not hit the big cities yet. Through my job at ALS, I knew how bad it was in some places. And this is one I will mention because it was on the front page of the Boston Globe. Um, the Vermont Law School, a fine, small, independent school uh, was fearful of collapsing in this period and almost did. Uh, and it, it became very public and other people were worrying about it. But in the big cities where we did not have as many students who had to move away to go to school and incur the additional costs of housing, many of our students still living at home to save money or living in a situation where they're with a spouse and their family and no one at Southwestern seemed to be thinking about the possibility that we could have a very traumatic situation because law schools, private law schools are very dependent on their tuition revenue. And one that doesn't have a central university to help it is in a particularly precarious position. In Looking at our reserves, I would joke that I understood why the board didn't share that information with me until I said, yes, I would be dean. Um, in looking at our reserves, they were very low. And some of that was this residence project, which Bryant, I really believe was one of the reasons we didn't have as big a losses in students as we would have otherwise had. I think it's made a huge difference in our recruiting um, to some families to know that their student can be living right in proximity to where they're going every day to class. Um, but um, the residences were delayed because um, the wrong consultant terms had to have been chosen to assess whether there was groundwater on the site. And it turns out there was when Southwestern's contractors were told there wasn't. And that delayed the opening. So we were not as full in the residences. Um, and so that had some economic impact, although certainly by year two, we have been near full and it's, it's been a tremendous success and a, and a tremendous community builder. I mean, Austin will remember how the staff were commenting that summer when school was starting that people were lined up to get in to start the orientation day festivities at Willicks Wilshire because they were right there. They could just get out of bed and get dressed and come over and um, be there at night. And it's really been, it's really been wonderful for the community building for other students as well, because people are always, always around. Um, so I um, I come and fortunately the wonderful Janice Manis 
and so many of you have spoken of, was still very much um, a figure at Southwestern in the chief administrative role. And Paul Kalish, the chief financial officer, were wonderful to work with. They both understood where our money was going. Um, they understood the underlying programs and impacts. Uh, and so I had colleagues to help me figure out where we were going to cut. And I thought, in retrospect, I was the right dean for this time because I have had to cut budgets before. And I think for an outsider to do it is a lot easier emotionally, but you have to have people who can help you understand what the impact might be of certain decisions. And I, I had that advantage. So Janice and I went into an executive session of the board about five weeks after I became dean and told the board that I was going to begin cutting everything that I could reasonably cut um, as soon as we got to the first of the year. I was not going to do it right before Christmas. Um, I eliminated over a probably more like a 20 month period. I think it was around 29 jobs, staff jobs. Um, at least one of those had a partial faculty component to it as well. And we found everything else that we could cut, including some things that we probably shouldn't have cut. But I was trying to stockpile as much cash as I could because I thought it was inevitable that we were going to see the student decline. And I didn't think our, our reserves were adequate to see us through that period. Well, as it turned out, we did not have as big a decline. I think our, our low number um, was in the 270s, um, not where I thought it might go, which was a lot lower than that, seeing what had happened some other places. And so we never had to spend a penny of what I was able to add to the reserves. So I think, um, one of, of the contributions where I was the central figure and perhaps the only one where I was the central figure um, was to really strengthen the financial posture of the school. And uh, with a freestanding, there aren't alternatives. And of course, our loan on the residences was new then. So we didn't have a track record with respect to that. So incurring more debt would have been difficult at that point and expensive as well. Um, in 2024, as I recall, Lee, we retired the last piece of the refinancing of the um, Felix Wilshire and Westmoreland building renovations, restoration, um, and the residences do support the debt on the residences, the way I think of it is very soon, Darby, you'll have a law school which is functionally debt-free, um, which is a great place to be. Um, and Lee is smiling because I know he pinched pennies himself for his entire time as Dean and that's part of what enabled him to do the acquisition of, of Bullock's Wilshire and to do such a beautiful job in, in um, making Westmoreland so functional with all that wonderful light coming in. It's such a bright, cheerful set of spaces over there. Um, the other um, things that I want to talk about really relate to the climate in the faculty and how collaborative and, and supportive faculty members are not only of one another and of students, um, but, but of the Dean. And I, I can say that um, from my ALS experience, I certainly learned that that is not um, the way it works everywhere. And in a lot of places, it doesn't work that way at all. But I think it's because people at Southwestern have built this culture where they, they think about the students and they think about the students first. And everyone collaborating, cooperating, living and let live sometimes, um, 
all is supportive of that. And I think that that is why when we began to think that one thing we might do um, is to take advantage of a close relationship that Robert Mena had built between us and the LSA prep course blueprint um, to think about something really experimental in legal education. Um, that project was one where we had tremendous breadth of faculty support. I think it was scary for many of us to think about teaching using technology. But the byproduct was we learned a lot along the way. A lot of thinking had, been, had gone on under the leadership of um, Catherine Carpenter with a broad-based big committee of staff and faculty. And, um, I participated in all of those meetings. Strong collaborative spirit there. Al Cowlin had been doing a lot of uh, exploration. He was, he was prominent in this. And while we, we ultimately gained uh, an enthusiastic variance from the standards from the ABA, we decided not to pursue this project because at this, about a month or two later, the ABA decided to liberalize its distance standard. We decided not to go forward with this full-blown project, which is probably one of the best decisions we made. But in the meantime, we had learned so much and we decided to try to improve the situation of evening students by adding more distance under the new standard to the evening program so that evening students only have to find their way to Southwestern two nights a week. Um, now, of course, the big, the big benefit in immediate terms was when we on five days notice we're told we had to stop operating in person. We had more people who had experimented with the technology and who were there to help others. And a group of technology staff um, built um, very consciously um, to um, strengthen us in that regard. Um, so the transition in the immediate COVID environment was much easier for Southwestern than it was for many, many law schools. Um, the, um, the other things I, I, can, um, I can say, I think I can probably work into some of your, some of your questions. Um, I, I will say that um, I really felt that um, the Southwestern faculty is comfortable with the idea of experimenting and doing things differently. And in my experience from the ALS vantage point, um, that's more rare than you might think it should be or think it may be. Um, and there's much more of a support one another spirit um, that um, I know from some of the illuminating things that Miradeo has pointed out in her book is certainly not characteristic of, of many schools. Her book that focuses on particularly uh, women of color in the professoriate. Um, so I think um, we have a treasure and um, I'm glad you said yes to this deanship, Darby, and I know you're gonna have um, a lot of fun and big impact. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Dean Prager. Um, the work you did, the very hard work you did on the finances really kept this school open and put it in a position to really be poised to look forward and to continue innovating. So I, I really want to thank all of you and, and the deans that I, I don't know and haven't met for the foundation, the legacy that you left. I'm not going to speak very long because early in 2022, I'm going to initiate a state of the law school address and we'll invite everyone back to, to hear more about my thoughts and visions about where we can go. But as I, I told everyone when I interviewed for the job, a, a vision is really a collective vision and I'm still learning. But I do come with three priorities for this year and for the foreseeable future. 
Uh, the first and foremost is to reduce our average student debt. Our student debt is currently more than $190,000. So many of our students are first generation. So many of our students want to go into public service and to take on social justice projects as early as possible in their career. And that's more difficult when carrying that type of debt load. So we are thinking uh, about how to approach that issue. But one early thing that we've done is um, along with the board, I've given the go-ahead to add additional major gift fundraisers to the Institutional Advancement Department, and we're working on that. We're also going to be adding a Director of Alumni Relations, a dedicated person to that field as well. I also want to, again, build on the foundation that you've all laid and recruit and retain the best faculty possible. We're in the, the process of hiring right now for a property law position. But something that many of you saw today, and this was due really to Dean Prager, um, I, I had the honor of being sitting in the seat when we got to press send of the announcement, but we just announced two inaugural chairs. Uh, Catherine Carpenter is now the inaugural Woods Chair, Arlie and, and William T. Woods Chair that had been a professorship, but we elevated it. And Miradeo is the inaugural Vano Spencer Chair. These are two um, excellent trailblazing professors, and they hold chairs that honor two of our trailblazing Black female alums. And that was really a remarkable opportunity for, again, me to have the honor to do with the hard work that Susan put in um, on this effort as well. And then a third initiative is really to build programs and initiatives to serve students holistically. We really believe that we need to remove as many obstacles as possible for students to learn. And you guys did so much of that, the beautiful Bullocks-Wilshire building and the library, the residences, Susan's initiation of the, the Dean's Task Force on Equity, Inclusion and Belonging, which we're continuing and just it's, it's a small thing, but a big thing all at the same time. But due to the hard work of Robert Minna and Shar Yu in his office, today we officially opened a food pantry for our students and employees who might have food insecurity. We're working on a series of programs like this to help improve the student experience for everyone. And then the final thing I want to do is just keep the secret sauce going. This is an incredible incredibly special place. I've been, this is my fifth law deanship. One of them was in the same place, but on the private and public side, and that, you know, going from private to public changes the nature of an institution. So I can say this is a place of amazing civility, respect, equity, inclusion, collegiality, and flexibility. And I'm trying to do no harm <laughs> there and to, to build on that because that's how you can get everything else done is the relationships that people have with each other across those lines. So with that, we have some questions rolling in and, and I sent out a few questions. I'm gonna ask a couple of questions from our audience to begin with. So Dean Taylor, you're up first. We have two questions from you. Um, one is, can you describe your foundational efforts in diversity and equity at Southwestern that you brought with you from the DOJ civil rights, um, from your background in the DOJ civil rights office? And can you also talk about the relationship you built with, the, with Nevada that meant that Southwestern was the primary law school from um, students coming from the Silver State until UNLV opened a law school? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Um... Well, from my college days, I was uh, very committed to civil rights and equal rights and inclusion. And um, it really started during my first year as a faculty member at DePaul University. Uh, when I started there, there were 720 students, all of them white, all but 12 of them male. Um, that may just disclose my age, but um, in any event, another professor and myself, Richard Turpington, who ended up at Villanova, <clears throat> were able to persuade the faculty, create a program, a summer program, in which we uh, were able to attract 30 African-American students that first summer, summer of 1970. 19, 19, um, and 
building on the success of that program uh, the following years, I was able to take some of those lessons learned to Southwestern. And um, really the, the commitment to inclusion and uh, diversity has always been there. I mean, I was always troubled by the fact that um, the bar results were not really um, good and they certainly weren't good for uh, people of color. Um, the bar almost seemed to have um, a purpose of exclusion, but um, in any event, we tried to work as best we could with those. Um, we did, over the course of years, attract um, a number of faculty of color, um, and we some of them moved on to other places, UCLA, University of Houston, um, but um, but certainly the lessons I learned uh, as a young legal law teacher uh, paid off after I came to Southwestern. Uh, with respect to Nevada, um, in fact, uh, for a brief period of time, we were, uh, the, the president of the Mormon church was a Southwestern grad from the 1930s. And we had one of the largest Mormon student populations of any school in the country. Um, and because of that connection and um, the influence that um, the prestige really that the president of the Mormon church brought to uh, Southwestern, we attracted a number of Mormon students from Nevada and a number of students from Nevada. Um, at that time when there was not a um, law school in Nevada, there was the Western Interstate Compact on Higher Education, which would pay some of the tuition of Nevada students for attending law school outside of Nevada. And we were able to be a beneficiary of that. And that lasted until UNLV was created and then try up completely, understandably. So we have several questions that I'm gonna to try to roll into one and let whoever wants to jump in to answer, answer do that. So we have a question about building on the legacies that you've all built, how do we do that? We have a question about how do we move up in the rankings and should that be important? We have a couple of questions about whether we should remain freestanding and independent or seek a merger with the university. So I'll ask it this way. Um, what do you perceive to be Southwestern's greatest opportunity? Well, I looked at those questions also, Darby, um, and um, perhaps I'll be the outlier here, but if you think about what goes into the rankings, things like LSAT and undergraduate GPA play huge roles, um, perceptions of the place play a huge role um, in categories like judges and partners in firms as well as um, deans and other academics. And my fear would be if we started concentrating on the US news game, that we destroy the heart of Southwestern. I think of Southwestern as a place where people who did not do everything perfectly as undergrads can thrive. Um, where people of all ages can come together uh, around their desire to do something, to become a lawyer. Um, and I think it's, it makes it a very special place because we're not driven by what a group of people who don't know anything about law schools came up with at US News a long time ago. Um, and Lee and Brian and I all go back long enough where we remember a world before the US news rankings existed. And they've really, um, really changed things. Um, I think um, there is one thing that we can try to work on um, and that is our name recognition outside of Southern California continues to be a 
not not good. And so um, that is one of the things that would affect reputation if we could figure out what to do about that. And I think um, Austin was really on the right track to find a way to work Los Angeles into the name. Um, it's one of the things I should have gotten done, Austin, and let myself get diverted by some of those more immediate problems, I think. Let me, let me address the, um, the I, I think it would be a terrible mistake to not remain independent. Anyone who has worked in an institution, at a law school that is university affiliated, knows what it's like to deal with provosts, assistant provosts, um, all sorts of university um, controls and uh, that have nothing to do with legal education um, or the educational mission of a law school. Now, I mean, all due deference to um, Brian Austin and Susan, uh, I spent years in institutions that were affiliated with universities. There were no real gains. And so unless some university came along and offered Southwestern a billion dollars for, for a merger I wouldn't even consider it. It was not in the school's interest. It's not in the profession's interest. And it's certainly not in our students' interest. Dean Garth. Well, good. We're getting, we're get, making it a little more excited. I mean, I, I, I would say about the Claremont Colleges, it's a loose confederation like the Big Ten. So you, you buy whatever services you want, and you don't buy those you don't want. So from my perspective, that was a win-win opportunity if we could have pulled that off. I think on the name recognition, I agree, but I, on the, the, the funny thing is whenever anyone would ask, they'd say Southwestern, what kind of a name is that? I'd go Northwestern, what kind of a name is that? You know, it, it has nothing to do with the Northwest. It's just a matter of people recognizing the name. And then, my perspective when I was there and might be wrong was that it's too easy for us to settle into an access school um, because we don't have to try too much harder to get more people in these jobs, more people, um, you know, better students, even though still the same students building on the same legacy. But my perspective, again, from my time there, my own whatever inner drive was that we were either going to be going up or we we're going to be going down and we needed to do the things that made us go up. Dean Parrish. You know, the only, only thing I might add is, um, you know, uh, Darby, I just think you've got a, an amazing uh, foundation to work with and, and frankly, not, not by us, by, by, by the people that are on the call, right? You, like, look at your recent hires, right? Like, Mira is doing fabulous work. Uh, Brian mentioned some of the people who previously, like Beth Caldwell came in 2012. That book that came out two years ago is absolutely phenomenal. You've got fact, you look at the clinics. Is there anybody doing more for, Cal for Los Angeles than, than Andrea Ramos with the Immigration Law Clinic or the Children's Rice Clinic? Those are great assets. Um, and so, you know, I, whether it remains independent or whether you look for a partnership, uh, the reality is that those schools like Claremont need you more than they need, than, than you need them. And we, we, I, I just hope you, we keep that in mind that, that it's a, it's a great asset. I, I personally could see some benefits on, a, on connecting with a place like, like Claremont, but, but they need the connection with Los Angeles. They need the connection uh, in, in the center of the city. And then you look, uh, and I agree, we've, we've been dramatically committed to diversity and inclusion all the way back uh, to the start. Uh, but I agree, it's not just access. I, I, I look at the people that I had in, in my classes and they were people like I, my very first year teaching, there was somebody who could have gone to Berkeley, but she was looking after her old elderly mom and, and needed to stay in Los Angeles. That, that person could have beat anybody at any, any of the other schools. I look at some of the grads who graduated. Um, like I remember there's just one, and I probably shouldn't mention names, but I remember Elliot Young came to me. I, I probably graduated 210, 211 or whatnot. And he told me that he was going to come back one day and he was going to buy the building. He also said he was going to clerk for the Supreme Court. He, he's got a phenomenal practice down in San Diego. He also wears the 
the best shoes of anybody I've seen, at least by his Facebook pages. He created his own firm and is doing amazing stuff. I, I think of Paul Chancellor, a guy who graduated in 2005 that only went to law school because his daughter was also going to law school at the same time. And he's had an amazing career as a patent lawyer. And so I, you know, there's a lot of crappy law schools out there and, and Southwestern is not one of them. It's got an amazing talented faculty. It's got an amazingly talented staff. It's located in probably one of the best locations you could get. And so I, I think the world is the limit. And I think Susan's done a great, uh, uh, done wonderful by the school for getting through a difficult period. And I think Darby, you're, you're, you should just go for the fences. And, and whether that means you jump, go with some other school, you stay independent. I, they need you more than you need them. You decide what's best. But the, the I, I think there's a lot that's sort of bent, uh, you know, sort of just ready to be unleashed, um, and both in the alumni base and in the faculty. And and uh, so I yeah yeah like I I think you pay attention to rankings. You don't you don't don't let it rule yourself. But uh, but it, it's a fabulous school. And um, I just I think you're just you're you're in a fabulous position to make a lot of a lot of difference. We inched into the next question I was going to pose, and that's what do you perceive to be Southwestern's greatest challenge at this time? Susan, you had mentioned name recognition. Some others agreed with that. The name recognition is, is the one that I think is the top of my list. I think there's a kind of one in the profession that I think I think I've heard Austin talk about this too. Everybody in these big law firms and you know inside counsel wants diverse hires, but they do not want to look outside of 20 or 30 schools to find them. And I think that's something, a structural kind of uh, bigotry that's out there that honestly, you know, should be fought, you know, all the way through. And just to go, I know this isn't a weakness, but you know, the data shows it, right? The data shows that people coming from Southwestern and Los Angeles stay longer. They make the firms more money. If the firms were smart, right? They would take more students from places like Southwestern and Loyola, and they would take less from Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. They, they just would because they make them more money. Um, there's a whole, there's a large amount of literature on the sociology of this. They, they're, they're wonderful partners. They're wonderful trained lawyers. And, and, they stay and that's and you can see it in the partner rankings right how, how do you explain that some of the biggest firms have a bunch of southwestern grads and it's the same thing when i was when i was that one year bernie jawowski who was the dean at drucker school and i went around to the managing partners at the uh, the large la firms we were trying to talk about some training programs that we were going to help them with and kind of connected to something we're doing with the leadership council on legal diversity and uh, it's, you know, you talk to one partner and they'd be like, well, you know, we, we don't take many people from Southwestern. And another person in the very room would be like the, <laughs> the leading rainmaker in the firm would say, well, you realize I'm a Southwestern grad and it would just shut the conversation down. And so, you know, it's just actually, I think, putting the hard numbers before some of them, um, letting them know that, you know, if they actually count the people in the firms, they'll see that they're Southwestern grads and they're, they're often the rainmakers. Well, I want to get, oh, Susan. The lateral movement now is just, it just continues to be a problem for the firms. Yeah. I want to give each of you an opportunity to share either your favorite story about Southwestern that you haven't been able to share or give us some, some final thoughts that we should keep in mind for the next 110 years. And I'm going to um, go in reverse order. So Susan, can I call on you to start this one off? Well, I'm going to pick your question about what, what do you perceive to be Southwestern's greatest strength? And I think it is its student-oriented culture. And I think it's real and it makes it such an exciting place to be. And it, what, I, um, what may tie more directly into your question is when I think about important moments at Southwestern, it was an event that the Black Law Student Organization planned after George Floyd's murder, um, where we learned some things that we didn't appreciate about Southwestern, where Southwestern had work to do in this territory. Um, and they, um, they did a beautiful job, very professionally 
strong in their message, but very professional. Um, and it, it was one of those transformative moments where students can make a huge contribution to the future of an organization. Thank you. Dean Parrish. No, I, I, I still remember the first, uh, first couple of days when I started teaching there. Um, for me, it meant a lot because my daughter was born, my, my eldest daughter was born the same week that I started teaching at, at Southwestern. And so I've been able to keep track of my time uh, in the academy because of, of her age. And, uh, you know, I think of all the greats at, at uh, you know, the late Myrna Rader, the late Karen Smith, uh, Judy Sloan, Bob Lutz, um, you know, all these amazing people that were incredibly supportive and made sure that I succeeded, uh, Kathy Carpenter, Chris Cameron, you. Um, and so I, I remember that uh, really fondly. And then frankly, uh, you know, I was honored. I, um, I was, uh, uh, it, was, it was really moving for me to receive an honorary degree in, in, at the 100th year celebration or uh, graduation. And, and that means a lot to me and I, I have it proud. And uh, so both of those moments stand out for me personally as things that I know is sort of selfish, but, uh, but things that mean a lot to me and both the start and, and having that opportunity for me and my family and, uh, and then uh, the honorary degree a few years ago. Thank you. Dean Garth. Uh, too many to say, you know, I, I'm tempted to say, this is kind of, you know, nostalgic, but I, uh, it was almost a favorite moment coming to work into that office. You know, that was such a, a warm setting. But I'll, I want to echo what Catherine Carpenter said, also when, when getting her chair, is meeting Arlie Woods also is something that for the first time, really makes an impression. And I also was very happy to be there. Then I'll do one more, one flip one, which is seeing Bob Dylan at graduation was you know, memorable. And then uh, the last one, since he's given a gift recently, is the first time I met Brian Panish, no one had ever visited him. And he was completely bored <laughs> by me there. He was sort of looking around the room. It just looked like it was going to be the most hopeless relationship we could ever have. And uh, lo and behold, you know, it, it turned around and uh, became quite a quite a nice relationship. Still friends with him today. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning Brian. His family is really uh, its own legacy at Southwestern. Dean Taylor. Uh <clears throat> The years I spent at Southwestern really were the most significant in my professional life. And um, I just appreciate having had that time and uh, really enjoying the people that I worked with, faculty, staff, and enjoying the students, many who I've kept up with. And I just hope that I will be able to continue to be of service. When I see the news about the accomplishments of Southwestern students and the new appointments of faculty or the faculty accomplishments, I have this enormous sense of pride. And I just hope that um, we'll see a continuation of all these things. And I'm sure that uh, Darby, you're going to make sure that we do see that continuation. But thank you for having me at this celebration. Well, thank all of you for being here to celebrate with us. Thank you to the law commentator, the students on the law commentator for this fantastic idea. Thanks to Robert Minna and the student affairs office for helping us develop the idea, to the staff of the Dean's office in Comark for doing all the logistical work to make this possible. And to everyone who joined us tonight and who's had a part in Southwestern's legacy, thank you. You are very important to us. And we're looking forward to working with you during the next 110 years. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful evening.